Uh, well, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everybody, here from London and the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, welcome to this uh, unique event, uh, celebrating, commemorating, looking at 125 years uh, of the LSE. Firstly, I'll say something about myself quickly. My name is Mick Cox, Professor Mick Cox. I'm an emeritus professor of international relations at LSE and a founding director of LSE Ideas, the LSE's foreign policy think tank. I'm very pleased this evening to welcome you to this uh, extraordinary event, really, with three former directors. We've never got them on one screen before together. And that is Tony Giddens in chronological order uh, in terms of when they were director. Uh, Craig Calhoun, who joins us from the United States, I believe, Craig. Nice to see you again, Craig. And Julia Black. And of course, we can't leave out our current director, uh, Dame Minouche Shafiq. So welcome to all four of you. Briefly, uh, on Tony Anthony Giddens, was educated at the University of Hull and the London School of Economics, <coughs> and was a director from 1997 to 2003. Uh, I want to say briefly about Craig. Craig was professor is now professor of social sciences at Arizona State University and centennial professor here at the LSE. He was director here from 212 to 216. Uh, Julia Black, strategic director of innovation, professor of law at the London School of Economics. Uh, she was pro-director of research from 14 to 19 and interim director from 2016 to 2017. And last but by no means least, Dame Manoush Shafiq, Director of the London School of Economics since September. And prior to this, she was Deputy Governor of the Bank of England and uh, an alumni of the LSE, where she also studied economics, MSc in economics. Now, briefly on the business, I just want to say for those Twitter users out there in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE125. You might have guessed. Uh, this online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties, which I'm sure we're not going to have. The format is going to be as following. I'm going to give a very, very, very brief introduction to the history of the school for 125 years, very brief, as much as I can do in six to seven minutes, maybe hopefully less. Then I'm going to ask each of the three former directors and, of course, the director four questions, which they've already received, get some feedback from them on their thoughts about the school from their own perspective from when they were director. And then we're going to open it up to questions and answers to all the many students and alumni and friends of the school who, out, who are out there watching it. So I'm going to just give a very brief outline of the school. As you noticed, it was established in a very important year in the history of London, 1895. It, it, I always say it was important for two reasons, one musically and the other one educationally. For those of you who didn't know, 1895 was the start of the London proms, long associated with the name of Henry Woods. I thought I'd bring that in for a little bit of culture. But educationally, the school uh, was established, launched the brainchild, we can actually say the brainchild, if that's the right term, of four very remarkable people. Uh, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, or the Webbs as they're often referred to, that great partnership between those two extraordinary people. The great Irish playwright, George Bernard Shaw, and Graham Wallace, the first professor of politics, political science at the LSC. Beatrice Webb, of course, was a re most remarkable woman. And if you read her diaries, you'll find out how remarkable she was. But she once said that the LSE was to quote her an odd adventure, an odd adventure. And in some ways it was an odd adventure. Why odd? Well, I suppose there aren't many institutions of higher education in the world, which were created by four Fabian socialists. This is the only one on historical record, I believe. There may be one in New York, the new school, but that was rather different. And it was an adventure. <clears throat> in the very beginning, for those of you who look at the early history, it was a real adventure. You didn't know if it was gonna succeed or fail. It didn't give degrees at first. These only came later on with the creation of the University of London, in which Sydney Webb, of course, had 
a very large hand to play. Um, cramped teaching facilities. If people moan about teaching facilities today at the LSE, they should have gone back to 1895 and known about cramped teaching facilities. It was all evening teaching. And by the way, uh, there wasn't much money either. Um, the first donation or the biggest donation to the school early came from a famous Fabian of history of the Fabian Society, Henry Hutchinson tragically committed suicide, but donated 10,000 to the school for Fabian purposes, notice for Fabian purposes. Only Sidney Webb and others then decided to move that or segue that over to the LSC, which caused a little bit of tension between the Webbs and indeed with George Bernard Shaw. Uh, it, it always had a lingering suspicion, which we'll also talk about, that the purpose of the school was to propagate socialism, but Sidney Webb was always clear about that. It was to do something more than propagate Fabian socialism. But that, that kind of image li lingered on, I think, for many years. What was the aim of the school? I've always tried to think about this one. Try, I thought I, it's a negative I give to it. It was not to be like Oxford or Cambridge. In, in some senses, many of the people who taught at the school at first had been taught at had, had you know, done their degrees at Oxford and Cambridge, but I think it was almost not to be an Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, not a classical education, but a practical education for the middling sort of people, as, and I'm quoting here from, uh, from Sydney. Webb. And it had to be in London. It had to be in London. It also had to be where it is in London, on the Aldwych, near to power. And Sydney Webb again was very clear about that next to the law courts, near the city of London and near Westminster. So it had to be the heart of the city. And the city, of course, always remember, was at the heart of the British Empire. And therefore, this would give the school its early global impact, not just educating a new kind of person, but also an internationalist dimension or a global perspective right from the very beginning. I'd also say the LSE was always research-driven, policy driven and problem solving. It wasn't, to, to use a phrase, a classical ivory tower. And I think the first courses, if you look back, as I've done in my research on the history, reflect a practical vision. It included economics, obviously, political science, obviously, railway economics, accountancy, first professor of accountancy was in fact it taught at the LSE. Banking was very prominent in the in the curriculum then and later, a commerce and industry, politics, public administration, sociology, social policy. You get the kind of feeling this was a very practically oriented social science institution and the only institution of the kind as well, which actually was purely for the social sciences as, as, as understood by the webs. Uh, I'd also stress one other thing too, we have a wonderful library here, as you know, at the LSE, the British Library of Political Science, but from day one, literally, a year after the school had been created in 1896, Sidney got, he was very good at raising money too, by the way, created the library, the British Library of Political Science, because he saw it as a central part of what the school was about for research, and that was a kind of research-driven kind of institution. I'd also say one other thing, Sidney and Beatrice, I think, were very English, it couldn't be said of George Bernard Shaw, for sure, but it could be said of the Webbs, I think, but they, they were open to ideas from other places in the world. <clears throat> Is it called a school? Well, it's named after the notion of a French école. You know, so they were borrowing from the kind of sense of an école uh, in France, a kind of way of teaching the elite or some members of the elite. They also borrowed from Germany. Well, well to remember how important Germany was in the mind of Sydney and Beatrice Webb as the model of higher education. And they also borrowed from some of the institutions in the United States, such as the Massachusetts Institute uh, of, of Technology. I also want to emphasize and make the point, it's an important point to make, the first degree awarded at the LSE was to a woman. Uh, it was a DSC, a, a Doctor of Science in e Econ, it was a DSC Econ, uh, to a Miss A.E. Murray and the thesis Quite, quite relevant for today, maybe. The thesis was on commercial and financial relations between England and Ireland, almost like she had some premonition of what was going to happen later on in Anglo-Northern Irish relations. Key moments in the history of the school, too many to mention, but I'll just touch on some of them. 
I hope I don't leave out the most important. Tony will no doubt pick me up, but there we go. I think there may, may be a key moment, apart from the foundation of the school and creating the school, getting it off the ground, launching this odd adventure as Beatrice School. I think a key moment came after World War I with the appointment of William Beveridge, um, well known as the founder of the welfare state, much debated today in terms of the <coughs> of eugenics, of course. But clearly he was a major appointment in the history of the school. And later on, many mentioned the fact that it was almost like a second launch for the school. But whatever criticism one might want to direct at uh, William Beveridge, um, and there are criticisms obviously to be made. Nonetheless, he was energetic. He knew how to raise money. He knew how to expand the school. And of course, he expanded the school, not only in terms of its intellectual reach, its global reach, uh, but also in terms of the school itself, in terms of its, its physical fabric. Um, I'd say another second moment in the history of the school was after World War II with a landslide Labour government. I say that not because the LSE was running the Labour Party at the moment, but it's well worth remembering that the Prime Minister of 1945 had taught at the LSE, Clement Attlee, uh, both before and after the end of the Second World War. And of course, the Chancellor of the Exchequer taught economics at the school, Hugh Dalton, in the, in the 1920s. I think a third key moment comes in the 1960s uh, with the Robbins report on the expansion of higher education. And of course, those famous troubles, not the Northern Ireland troubles this time, but the troubles at the LSE, which gave the LSE the reputation it may or may not have deserved. But it's, it certainly fixed itself. In, 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 it's had a stickiness. I remember Tony Giddens saying this one. It's got a stickiness in the, in the memory of many people, maybe for the wrong, uh, maybe for the right reasons. So the Robbins report on the expansion and then the troubles together. I think that then brings us to another key moment, I'd say, and I'm drawing my comments to an end now. I think another key moment, I'm bound to say this, it's not because I've got favorite or less favorite directors. How can I say that in front of this august group in front of me? But I, I do think Ralph Darendorf was a key moment too in the history of the school. A remarkable person, absolutely remarkable person. I've written about him. And of course, Ralph went on to write the definitive 100th anniversary history of the school in, in, in 1995. And I, I never knew Ralph himself. I know Tony did, and he'll say a few words about, about Ralph. But a, a really quite remarkable person who came out of Germany after the war, you know, was educated here at the LSE, was influenced by a man called Karl Popper, famous philosopher, came back to the school as director. It was quite a controversial appointment, you know, not a non-Brit running it, a German leading, a leading European film. But I think that was an immensely important moment in the, in the maybe the renewal of the school or, or taking the school forward. A few years later, I'd say that Mrs. Thatcher coming to Paris is a rather important moment, part of the school because in some ways, some of the people who influenced her philosophically and economically had themselves taught at the school. People like Hayek. When people think of the school as being a kind of a, a left, left or socialist institution, I always say, remember Hayek, remember Lionel Robbins, remember the free marketeers who did so much to influence uh, Mrs. Thatcher and her ideas. And I think finally in 89, the end of the Cold War opened up an entirely new world, a world of globalization, a world of global change, new economies come into play and change the nature of the world and indeed it changed the face of the LSE today, the rise and the rise of Asia. So from small beginnings to world-class institution, it's an extraordinary story, it genuinely is, a, it is an extraordinary st story. We're always bound to mention the 13 prizes uh, in economics, Nobel prizes, but I, I, as a social scientist who's not an economist, I always like to say our first prizes were also in literature, uh, Bertrand Russell, and George Bernard Shaw, and three of our prizes, by the way, have been in peace. President Santos of uh, Colombia, Philip Noel Baker, the first professor of international relations at the school, a remarkable person, and of course, the great Ralph Bunch, uh, who was awarded that in, in, in the 1950s. We've got, a, according, to the, according to what I'm told, we've got 34 past PMs and presidents and all sorts of other people. One, somebody once said to me, Manoush, does the LSE run the world? I said to that answer, I do not have an answer to that question. I don't have an answer. But we have 150,000 alumni and many. I won't mention them all. The only thing I always say by way of a flippant uh, remark is two of our most famous alumni either did not complete a degree or did not finish it. 
And that's John F. Kennedy, who did not start it because of illness in the 30s, and who did not finish their degree, Michael Philip Jagger of the Rolling Stones. And I always say that because it's always on the websites everywhere. Who's the most famous alumni of the LSC? I'm sure there's, there's more important people to mention. But anyway, that's all I want to say by way of brief 125 years of the history of the LSE in, in, in six, six very brief minutes. We're now moving on to the next part where I start asking each of our panelists, each of our uh, directors, past and present, four questions briefly. And the first question I'm going to ask, and we're going to, it is as follows. And I, I said a bit about uh, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, George Bernard Shaw, Graham. Wallace, the founders of the school, without whom the school would never have come into being and we wouldn't be here today. If the LSE founders, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, just say, were able to walk down Houghton Street today, what do you think they would say about the school? And I'm going to run in the order of Tony, Craig, Julia and Manoush. Okay, the ghosts come down the street. What do you think they'd say about the school today, Tony? Well, first of all, good evening, everybody. And let me say how great it is to be back at the LSE or sort of back at the LSE and thank Mick for that terrific introduction. Um, I already learned a lot <laughs> about the history of the LSE. I believe with Mick Jagger, what happened, he told his supervisor he's going to go off and pursue a career in music. And the supervisor being sage and wise says, you'll never make any money at that. <laughs> How long can you be? Anyway, I'd like to um, congratulate Mick on all the work he's done on the history of the LSE and LSE ideas. I'd like to pay tribute to Minouche for her extraordinary leadership with the LSE through this really, really testing and difficult period. And I'd like to congratulate Minouche on a book, What We Owe Each Other, which I have read large chunks of and um, which certainly stands in LSE traditions. If Beatrice and Sydney were walking down Houghton Street today, you know, they might think, well, it's impressive, all those glittery buildings and whatnot. But I think what they'd really be staggered by is just the massive intellectual reputation that the school has built up over the years. Plus, as you said, Mick, the huge range of intellectual all-stars who've taught and researched here. I think you're quite right to mention Ralph Darendorf specifically. I mean, I was friendly with Ralph for many years and he was an extraordinary figure in many ways. And uh, he's deeply missed and made uh, terrific contributions to a whole range of the social sciences. But I think it is the case, you know, that the founders wanted their creation to have a practical impact on the world. And the school has really always been in the forefront, to my mind, of um, connecting theory and practice. And I have to say, when I travel around the world, it, uh, because I tried to promote the LSE in areas where it wasn't quite as well established before, like Latin America, I found that, um, you know, the word, the, the phrase LSE had greater name recognition than either Oxford or Cambridge. So uh, something important has been achieved there. I mean, I mustn't talk for too long, but I was walking along Buenos Aires waterfront and I thought, you know, this is an important point, place to promote the LSE. Probably never heard of the LSE down there. Someone came up to me and said, oh, you're Tony Giddens. I know you. I've got an alumni group here in Buenos Aires. So that's how the world works. I would suggest for this discussion, one interesting theme might be like the invention of tradition, because when students and others come to a university, they tend to think it's always been like it is at the moment. But this is never the case. Eric Hobsbawm was the famous historian who wrote the book, The Invention of Tradition. You remember said the Scottish kilt was invented by a Lancashire industrialist. It's not steeped in tradition as supposed to be the case. And um, the graduation ceremonies to me are quite a good example of that. I mean, they were only created, I think in 2008. And now, you know, I think they throw their mortar boards in the air and all that kind of thing, which is like the Americanization really of higher education. And, it's sort of linked to fundraising. 
I used to like speaking at a graduation ceremony, so, and I used, used to finish by saying, LSE, the one and only place to be. And I hope everyone in the audience still would agree with that sentiment. Thanks very much, Tony. Straight over to Craig. Americanization has been mentioned, Craig. But uh, I think you're going to say a little bit more than that. Craig, over to you. Very nice to meet you again. Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, my time at the LSC was one of the really thrilling and exciting phases of my life. I'm grateful for that opportunity. And I'm you know, almost as grateful for the opportunity to spend an hour with you all today. I echo Tony's um, gratitude to you, Mick, for work on the history. I remember when we started mm -hmm. that project. I remember when you guaranteed you would finish the book, but we won't go there. Um, and thanks to Julia, whose leadership I got to see firsthand, to Tony's, who I knew about um, and was pervasive in the institution, and to Minouche, who has carried on so well the great achievements, the LSE. But if the founders were walking down Houghton Street, as you say, Mick, I mean, literally walking down Houghton Street, what would they say? Um, where are the workers? the natural beneficiaries of socialist higher education, the people who will make transport and street lighting and trade unions and London infrastructure work. They might also say, how much did all this cost? <laughs> They'd probably ask, where is the library? But while they would probably be impressed with the global reputation of the LSE that Tony cited, if that's in fact evident on Houghton Street. Um, Houghton Street actually has a lot of people who ask sharp critical questions about whether we deserve the global reputation that everybody else in the world knows we deserve. <laughs> but I think they'd say, this is all good, but what are we actually doing? How are we making the world change for the better now? Okay, to the point. Uh, um, I think we'll just move on straight away. Good question. Julia, do you have an answer to that question? I have lots of answers to that question, actually, because we've made huge impacts, huge impacts. Thanks, but Craig. Not, I, don't need to, I do need to advertise the LSE, I don't think, to, to this no. audience. But genuinely, what do I think they would say? I think, um, I think in a way, they would say, my, haven't you grown? You know, you think about how started it small, how small it started, you know, didn't even start in in Houghton Street had to borrow some rooms from the RSA to do some teaching in to run the seminars. So um, they would, I think they would be impressed just with the, the scale. Now they might not, they might be uncomfortable with the scale, but I think they'd be impressed with the scale of it. I think the second thing is they, they, might, they might ask about the fundraising. So we were, you know, so we were recipients of the beneficiary of the, initially of the, the, of the quest. Um, and Mick, you've written about and um, picked up in Lord Haldane's biography about how we managed to sort of wangle that through clever legal advice, may I say, to ensure mm -hmm. that actually that the quest landed up enabling us to, to found the LSE. Uh, you know, we had land grant from, uh, from London. We've had the Tata um, donation at critical moments. We had the Rothschild donation at critical moments. So I think they would, they would be quite keen to know, you know, how are we, how are we doing on that kind of fundraising aim? I think the other thing they would be, be looking at to Craig's point about, okay, so who's being educated here? I think they would be astonished at the range of students who are being educated here. I think they would be absolutely astonished at their global nature. Um, I think they started out with a very London, London focus, kind of London, UK government, UK public policy, get the machinery of government to work. I think they'd be impressed that we do still focus on very much on the machinery of government. But I think what's also forgotten is that they also focused strongly on business education. Um, and that was a core part, getting commerce working and working in the right way. I think, um, you know, we don't educate army officers anymore uh, in the way that we did. We, we did for, for years. So they might ask what's going on there. Um, and then I think they, so I think they would be struck by all of those different things. And I think they would be struck by the sheer range, scale and variety of the nature of the activities and the research that goes on at the LSE and therefore the nature of the engagement and impacts that it has. And then finally, I think they, they like, you know, if we're really talking about them walking down Houghton Street now, they'd be going, what are these funny things that people are holding in their hands? And, and how is it that you've managed to actually educate, continue educating people when nobody could meet? 
<laughs> Thanks, Julie. On the, on the question of fundraising, I, I, Sydney was a, a, ma a master with uh, Beatrice. The other, the other great funder of the of, of the school in the interwar period was, of course, the Rockefellers. That was a, that was a huge donation to, to the to, to the school, which Craig and I did some work on when when, when the old man was still alive. And uh, you know that was great fun, Craig. I remember that. The army class also should be remembered because you, I was going to mention it briefly, Julia. Yeah, people don't know, probably don't know that now unless you do the history, but there was actually an army class at the school from 1902-3. It was established by Halford McKinder, the second, uh, second director of the school, and lasted until 1930. and was actually seen as a, a major contribution to professionalizing the administration of, of the army after the disaster of the Boer War. Another part of the extraordinarily interesting and rather remarkable part of the history of the LSE, Minush. Last uh, but not least, as I keep saying, I won't repeat that again. Over to you, Manish. I agree very much with the sentiments uh, that my predecessors have said about what has changed. I was the thing I would focus on if they visited Houghton Street was how they would probably find that the spirit of the place was still the same, and I think it would surprise them how much many of the values that they brought to this project have persevered. In particular, the LSE is still a place obsessed with data and evidence. That's very much the legacy of the Fabians and the Webs. It's still obsessed with research on current topical issues, uh, not an ivory tower, as you said, Mick, but you know, what are the issues of the day? What, are, you know, what, are, mm. what should you be thinking about? It's also a place that's full of challenge still, like they were. Uh, you know, I often joke that Oxford and Cambridge trained the people who ran the empire and the LSE trained all the people who overthrew the empire. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I think, still true. Uh, and I think if they saw our mm -hmm. current strategy and all the signs that say shape the world, they say, well, of course, that's exactly what we intended. We intended you to shape the world. And so I think the thing that would be really striking, while all the physical dimensions of the school are completely different, the spirit of the place still still embodies what they intended. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that observation, Manoush. The other thing I, I was going to stress, but all four of you have kind of mentioned it too, is simply the notion of public engagement. I remember when Craig first came to the school and Craig said, the public engagement, the public lectures alone, you know, are a massive contribution, a massive contribution, not just to a London debate or a British debate, but to an international debate. And I don't think there is it. I'm not just boasting, but I think I probably am. I don't think there's anything else like it anywhere else that I have known of. Craig, you've, you've traveled the world, we all have, but there's nothing quite like the, that public engagement, which I think is such a crucial part of our legitimizing ourselves before a wider, wider public around the world. I think that's really, really very important. I know Tony was very important in that too, if I might say so, Tony, in, 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 in not reviving that, but carrying that great spirit of public engagement forward through your own public lectures at the LSE, which I, I, I watched at the time before I arrived at the school. Now we come then to the second question, which is, more, I suppose, more personal. What, were, <laughs> what was the greatest challenge you faced? You can be honest here, all of you, or not. <laughs> I'll leave it up to you. What was the greatest challenge you faced in your role as LSE director? Tony, Craig, Julia, and Manoush again in that order. Tony, over to you. The audience will be glad to know that I'm not going to start every session. <laughs> <laughs> this is the second, I think, the only time that I'm going first again, at least I hope so. It is, I mean, yeah. The, the greatest challenge to me was I'm really being director at all because um, this has always been an interest of mine, a theme of mine. So many things that happen to people are largely the result of luck or contingency. And then they rewrite a narrative of self or a narrative, let's say, of an institution as if it must have happened like that. But chance and so forth are, are crucial. For example, you go into a pub one night, you meet someone, you get married, seems like it had to be, but you might have gone in a different pub that night. And that's how the world is. So the story of I, how I got here is peculiar one. I'll tell it very quickly. I had no intention or desire to become the head of the LSE. I had a cushy job in Cambridge. I was in King's Cole, which is truly beautiful. I had a very good faculty to run. 
And then some headhunter contacted me. I think it was the first time the LSE had ever employed a headhunter, if I remember. And then I suppose, well, um, I thought I'd better give it a go. And so it happened in spite of my inclinations rather than because of them. And that's true of so many things, I think. You always rewrite as a narrative things that happen mm, mm. in many different um, ways. I have to say, when, when I was at the LSE, I did give a lot of attention to the external program, uh, which was discussed earlier, because it seems to be such a crucial part of LSE life. And I'd like to pay tribute to Alan Ravel mm -hmm. and his role in that, which is now, I, I gather, a pretty long standing one that goes back a long way. I mean, for me, I set myself two main tasks, attracting further global leading academics. I always thought, as I've said before, the cutting edge of the LSE is really intellectual quality and practical application. And of course, doing something about strolling down Houghton Street, the dilapidated site. So I suppose, you know, one of the main things in my time was the saga of the library. Um, most students won't even probably know that the library was completely different in a different place and a mm. different form. Um, the library project was a huge project. I don't know if the general board still exists, but if it does, everything had to be got past the general board. <laughs> the library project, if I remember, only got passed by two votes in the, in the general board. So. A lot of contingency in that. We had to move the whole um, two million books and find a building to put them in. We did that and they were recatalogued. And then we had to move back into the new library building. Of course, you're a student at the LSA, you think the new library building is an old library building, it's been there forever, but this is certainly not the case. I'd like to pay tribute to Christine Chalice and um, Adrian Hall for just a massive amount of work that went in. The whole thing was done, I think, in about two years, the, not just the library, but mm. the library plaza. Finally, what I wanted to do was, you know, without usurping anyone else's role, be an intellectual leader, not just an apparatchik. So I used yeah. to give these directors lectures to the LSE community, mostly got really good response of those. And then I changed to the director's conversations and I had a whole load of conversations with um, significant figures. One of the things is that you can attract anyone, you know, more or less, to, go, to get to the LSE. Soros, of course, was at the LSE, had a very good one with him, and then another one with Bill Clinton, and President Clinton. So these are some of the things which stick in my uh, memory. And I think I'd still repeat the phrase, whatever you do with the buildings, the core thing, as other people have said, is intellectual quality, practical impact, those two things being combined, being in the Avalon card. Thanks, Tony. Over to you, Craig. Well, great. Let me um, say thank you for the invitation to be honest. I will indeed be honest, but I will not tell the whole truth. <laughs> um, <clears throat> challenges. Well, one um, big challenge was encouraging a spirit of innovation when the school had just been through a wrenching upheaval. LSE, as everyone has noted, has been innovative throughout its 125 year history, but trauma doesn't always make people feel that it's easy to innovate. Um, and sometimes not even easy to be collegial. Um, and uh, this nonetheless was crucial because the school didn't have the option of sitting still or of simply trying to consolidate itself. Um, I arrived shortly after the change in the funding scheme meant that all students were um, paying substantial fees, most of them British students going into debt to do so. Um, the um, organization of the school um, uh, in many cases needed, and in any case uh, was uh, made uh, different. The mission of education something that I know has continued to be in the forefront for Julia after me and for Manoush after me, um, wasn't always um, on the front burner, if you will. It wasn't always job one. And so part of the innovation that the school needed to resume was to 
to move forward with that as a top priority. Um, we had always been and remained innovative in research. We weren't always innovative in how we did things, and this was important. And it was especially important because I think an issue for the LSE for decades has been maintaining its distinctiveness um, while also being incorporated into a hierarchy and system of higher education. I mean, the LSE was founded independent. It then became part of a national system. It has maintained some of its independence in various ways. And one bit of that goes to fundraising, having other sources of revenue besides the state. Um, Tony uh, talked about this and how it figured uh, with the Tata gift and other stages in the LSE's history. Um, but it was an important agenda for my era at the LSE to decide that we needed to treat potential philanthropic gifts, not as extraordinary windfalls, but as part of how the school worked. And we have benefited from a range of important donors. One of my strong early memories was meeting with Firuz Lalji when he was a very unhappy donor and working to explore how to have a better partnership. Um, I've just had the news recently, as everyone else has, of John Phelan's gift of, to endow the um, LSE US Center. This is a continuing process and, um, and it remains important uh, for the school, even if controversial, because a lot of us would rather the funding just come in a check from the state with us uh, given the right to decide how to deploy it. Mm -hmm. Can't stop without saying in terms of big challenges, deciding to close Houghton Street for construction was a big <laughs> challenge. The construction was long overdue because every director before me was smarter than me and said, well, we can't possibly close Houghton Street. It doesn't matter if he's building falls down, we can't close Houghton Street, we can't do this. Um, supported by uh, donors um, and by the school as a whole, we undertook the long overdue construction. We have beautiful, um, buildings as a result that also advance our mission, including our educational mission. They're not just nice places to work. They provide great teaching spaces and support um, for the overall education mission of the school and so forth. And they help integrate the estate into a campus so that the LSE is more of a physical whole with flows through all of it. Um, so that was a great challenge. I do feel the result was a happy one. I'm sure it is, and I think it has been. Uh, Julia, over to you. Julia? Yeah, thank you. And again, thank you for the opportunity. And I have to have to say, Craig, you know, the and the innovations, the US Centre that you just referenced, you know, was started under, under your watch, the Africa Centre as well. So these things take a while to come through to fruition, but they were part of the innovations uh, that you introduced. So. So, so listen, Tony and, and, and Craig have focused on the internal. I'm, I'm going to focus on the external because it turned out that 2016-17 was quite a busy year in external events. So I think the just as I was sort of hand, the, we have the handing over from, from Craig to myself, we had the Brexit referendum. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of walked into walked into to the directorship and walked into Brexit at the same time. Um, and that was a huge, that was the, that was just a huge emotional shock uh, for the country, uh, for, for our friends in Europe, um, and for many around the world, actually, just to watch that. And I think it's, you know, if we think back to that date in June, then it's, you know, that, as I say, that, that emotional shock. And so the school, as everybody else, was in an emotional shock, whether they, whether people had voted leave or remain, it was a shock, whatever the result was, but, and, um, and as and statistically, we had leavers and remainers, you know, represented in the school as they were represented in London, as you would imagine. And so that was that was quite an emotional um, moment to, to work through with the school. A lot of very anxious faculty, as you can imagine, a lot of very anxious students as to how the future was going to work forward. Um, and in terms of how that was going to impact our finances as well. So so there was that kind of external event to work through. So we were just working through that when the government decides to introduce a whole new regulatory regime for higher education so that we will be 
split and have a new regulator for the Office of Students that will be very market orientated um, and didn't really have much sense of the overall purpose of universities and autonomy of universities. So it was kind of then with a, a policy scramble to make sure that those of that autonomy of universities were protected and got that in the bill and Tony you and the Lords and other sort of friends in the Lords were very helpful and instrumental in making sure that we could kind of battle that one and then we were just working our way through that when we had terrorist attacks uh, in London so we had the attack on um, uh, London Bridge attack on Westminster we knew that we had colleagues actually in Westminster at the time of those attacks etc so very febrile and we knew the campus itself was was under under threat um, and we also at the moment we had an electricity outage down Aldwych which at the moment was a massive, massive event, right? Because we had to evacuate the school and, and just how are we going to cope? And now it's just like a walk in the park. Um, and then finally, I do remember the end of one quite eventful week when, you know, these things kind of roll in after you. Somebody, Andrew Young actually phoning me up on Friday afternoon saying, Julie, we, you found an unexploded bomb just outside towers. <laughs> I said, don't worry, it's all under control. But, uh, that kind of summed it up really uh, in terms of the week. So. Yeah, lots to do internally, obviously, but it, the main challenge is actually with those experts. It was just a very busy time in terms of external events that were going on at the time, navigating yeah. those and taking the school through those because everybody was hugely uh, perturbed by each one of those in very different ways. So those were, I think, yeah. were my biggest challenges. But I, we came I, I, through. Thanks, Julia. I just throw in a little autobiographical piece. I, of course, being the LSE, we held an enormous meeting on the evening of June in 260 and I was there with many many other people and I remember the first first the first announcement came through five past ten that evening all of us sitting in the Sheikh Zaid theatre um Nigel Farage has declared that Remain has won I thought, oh well I can go home now and then the evening wore on and I, I think the, I, the point you make about shock and I, I think it did run through the school there may of course be a number of uh leave people at the school I, I think i have to be honest and say i think they're in a minority but nonetheless they are here there's no question about it and they have very, every right to be so but i i agree with you entirely the shock of the shock of that evening i don't think i where were you on on the moment it actually happened and i think all of us can come up with a point where we actually were and i remember um i was sitting in the dock of the bay i was in santa barbara <laughs> <laughs> exploring, exploring the um i was out there on, on looking at the californian education system the whole team of us we had about 20 of us there yeah. um, and we were all sitting watching the results of course with the time delay um yes. watching it come in and the mood on the table just getting slower and lower and lower and I, have yeah. to say, I was sitting next to i was sitting next to a guy from ireland and i just turned yes. to him and i just said good friday agreement what's going to happen to good friday agreement that was my first reaction so i was sitting on the dock of the bay i have to say yeah. I was well, going to tell you, I was with you, Mick, um, as the LSE explored this. And it's one of the great kind of LSE things to yes. have this range of different intellectuals and specialists debating, talking with each other in real time while history mm. is being made, uh, trying to understand what different constituency results meant and so forth. And I have yeah. to say Simon Hicks in particular stood mm. out that night. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Simon was a hero that evening, I have to say. I must say, one of the greats. Uh, Minouche, well, you've had a pretty big challenge as LSD. Yeah, this one is easy for me yeah. to answer. It's obviously COVID. And, yes, um, yes. You know, it's been a, amazing to watch the school cope with the pandemic. Mm. I sometimes say, you know, if I had taken a proposal to academic board to move one course online, it would have taken 10 years of trench warfare to get that approved. Mm -hmm. We did it in a week. The whole, you, the whole school moved online in a week. And the way faculty just rose to the challenge and adjusted and learned to teach online instantaneously was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And the fact that our student satisfaction numbers were fantastic this year. Mm. despite this, which is, is really extraordinary. I think the other thing we learned in this pandemic is, um, I think the LSE, when I, you know, had, had, well, lacked confidence in its own administrative ability. You know, we were all really smart and brainy and the academic side was great, but we didn't really, we weren't very good at running ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think during this pandemic year, we learned that we're really good at running ourselves. We can be really fantastic. And, you know, Andrew Young was a complete hero in, 
putting in place a testing regime on campus, which, you know, I often wished he was just running the country's testing regime, <laughs> tracking regime, because we had one that really worked and we had no outbreak and we had very few cases. Um, and the other weird thing about this year has been, you know, even though we've spent the whole year on screens like this, mm. um, in a weird way, the LSE community has gotten stronger over this mm. year. People have really looked after each other. And many people have said to me, I've never felt more a part of the LSE than during this pandemic year, even though we've been physically separate. Because the sense of community, people looking after each other, the institution looking after its staff, the staff putting, you know, going the extra mile to make things continue to work. So it's been a really difficult year, mm. but also a really, um, you know, a really moving and uh, mm. A reinforcing year of, for the values and the commitment that people mm. have at the school. Well, personally, I want to say thank you to you and all the leadership at the school because I just couldn't imagine. Rick, could I say something briefly about Please that? Please do, Tony. Yeah, of course you can. Well, I think it's very important what Manush just said because I think you can generalize that. The pandemic is an awful tragedy. Mm. But I think this is a time of creativity and innovation. And it's quite extraordinary how digital interconnection has allowed us to carry on so many enterprises creatively in a way that wouldn't have been possible even 20 years ago. Mm, and that's mm. been responsible for a kind of global containing of the pandemic. And digital interconnection has also been responsible for the creation of vaccines on a global scale. So mm. there's a huge creative side to all this, which you know, the pandemic reflects the level of our global interconnection, but so do the responses. Mm -hmm. Many of those, I think, you know, have to be looked at because it's an extraordinary situation. The world hasn't been in this kind of situation before. This is Can I jump in on that, Mick? I was about to bring you in, Craig, and Julia as well. Craig, please. Well, I just want to underscore something that Manish said. And this is you know, the gossip I get thousands of miles away from the LSE. But one thing that has been recurrently emphasized is that the LSE acted with care for all of its members, mm -hmm. um, for the students, for the faculty, and for the staff. And that and for the staff part has been underscored in a number of reports to me, um, talking about how good people felt to be in this setting that acted with mutual care. Um, they may have meant they felt good because they received the care, but they meant they felt good being a part of an institution that was caring. And I think this too, as Tony points to the intellectual interconnections, the sense of care and mutuality is, has become an important theme, much more visible and foregrounded um, in public discussions during the pandemic. And it's good to see the LSE um, doing this. And it overcoming some of the kinds of caste divisions that are too often part of universities. <laughs> yeah, great point. We got two, two large questions to come, but I'm, I'm also conscious of time. I'm also conscious that I want to bring in the, uh, the, the, the broader questions coming from, from our students and alumni uh, out there. But I, I, I'll move, I, there's a question I've got there about your fondest memory of the school. Uh, if you want to have a fond memory, Manoush, uh, you want to have your fondest? We'll do this very quickly because I really do want to get on to that last question about yeah. the challenges facing universities going forward. We've already touched on at least two of those, one in this country, at least Brexit, the pandemic, but there's many more besides. So let's briefly go over your fondest memory <laughs> and then we'll move on to that last question and then I'll move over to q and I I think we're beginning with uh, you this time, Manoush, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, from when I was a student, it ah. was uh, going into Wright's bar and meeting my mates in what was then a smoke filled place. Oh. Uh, but I have to confess now that I'm the director, uh, I don't go in to Wright's anymore because oh. there's so many other places to have coffee. But and I'm put to shame because they have reminded me at Wright's that Craig used to go in regularly <laughs> for a bacon roll. And I and I have not kept up that tradition. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you say that Wright's Bar, most people here may not know, but Wright's Bar is that wonderful little cafe right, ne right next to the entrance. And in those days, it was the only place you could get a coffee, whereas now you can't walk more than three steps. Well, I, I, I once asked for coffee, coffee in there, and they said, we, don't, we only do tea, very strong tea, I remember. But, uh, 
And I, 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 my, my, my diet at that stage was not very good, I have to say. Your fondest memory then, uh, Julia? Um, so mine, as I say, 2016-17 is quite a busy year externally yes. and uh, included an election. And you just referenced the, 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 the Brexit night, but the election night that yes. on for that tw uh, 2017 oh. election that Theresa May called, that to me was just LSE at its best. It, yeah. it was just brilliant. It was alive. It was alert. You had reporters in multiple languages, in multiple different corners of the building, commenting on the election. You had our faculty there, you know, watching the countdown coming in, doing the analysis live as it was coming in. Absolutely fantastic. LSE is its best. Really fuzzy, vibrant and engaged. Absolutely. I, I agree entirely with that one, Julia. We're moving on very quickly on this, uh, Craig. Fondest memory apart from meeting me. <laughs> Degree ceremonies. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. The yeah. students are all cleaned up. Yeah. Uh, when the parents are there, both relieved and proud. Um, and when you have a chance to celebrate of the school, as well as to have a sense of optimism for the future Absolutely. from um, all these wonderful graduates. So I love degree ceremonies. And I have to say they are a gift that keeps on giving because wherever I go in the world, um, a little bit like Tony's story of Buenos Aires, I'm apt to be approached as somebody who says, you probably don't remember me, but you shook my hand in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and where else can you get piped into Beethoven, you know, I mean, uh, fondest memory, Tony. Um, well, I've got some unfond memories because- No, no, we don't want <clears> those, <throat> we want the fond ones. Well, very quickly, the LSE wouldn't let me go on to do a PhD. Oh! <laughs> so I protested and I wrote an MA on sociology of sport, which was like a protest gesture. Fondest <laughs> memory for me, no question. The visit of Nelson Mandela. Yeah. I mean, about the year 2000, 2001. He came early to, this, to the event. I had about 45 minutes with him in the room. We had, it was in the largest lecture theater. The audience was stuffed with lawyers and others who helped him um, get his release. He gave a wonderful speech. And he didn't know it, but we, we'd arranged from the singer, Joan Armour Trading, to come onto the stage. We lifted the curtain. She came and she sang this song, The Messenger. People in the audience were in tears, I can tell you. And mm. Nelson Mandela got on the stage and danced um, <laughs> to the tune. And I never experienced uh, anything even close to that. Mm. in my time of the LSE for emotion, involvement, yeah. and, you know, tears. That's, wonderful. that's a wonderful tears memory. Of joy. Tears no, that's, of joy. Uh, that's, that's wonderful, Tony. And us academics can be a little bit too sceptical and cynical, but that's such a wonderful memory for you and indeed for the rest. And indeed, I can also say for many great moments, both in the old theatre in particular, which I love, it is still my, I, I think the other lecturers in the Sheikh Zayi, but I think so many great events I can remember not only intellectually, but also very personal to me in the old series, and I'm sure you can as well, Tony and Craig, so many great events then, Julia as well. Anyway, getting on to number four. Oh, this is, <laughs> good Lord. <laughs> One word answers, please. What, are, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing universities today? I mean, throw that one in. I don't know where we go with that one. Julia, I'm afraid you've got to kick that one off. What um, are the biggest challenge? You mentioned a few already, but uh, any, anything yeah. you want to add? Um, yeah, no, I think it's the um, it's that scepticism about experts. It's that mm -hmm. post-truth society. It's the, the technocratic experts. What do you know? Who knows anything mm -hmm. apart from your own personal lived experience is the only valid thing to, to know. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's obviously a role for knowing that, but there is a role for research. And so continuing to make that argument for education and research and continuing to argue that actually education research in social sciences is absolutely essential to be able to deal with the, the problems etc of the world today it can't mm. it, science and technology are important they have a role to play but actually without social sciences they're not going you you don't have a purpose no, so it's no. articulating the value of research education and particularly in social sciences yeah, if the pandemic has brought out anything, it's the absolute necessity, not only of workers on the ground, as Craig would put it, 
but also experts. I mean, <laughs> we rely more and more on experts to get us, to get us out of the mess, which, which we happen to be in. Um, Craig, yourself, biggest challenge going forward? Look from where you are, where we're sitting here, what do you think? Sense of mission and purpose. I think the biggest challenge is having clarity about what universities want to accomplish, what they want to contribute to the larger society, what their goals are for themselves, because we are in this extraordinarily um, rapidly changing environment. We are challenged for funds. We are um, facing some basic investment decisions. And if we don't have a sense of purpose, then we end up just conferring prestige and credentials, but not um, doing the kind of work that the webs and the founders challenge the LSE to do, identifying and delivering distinctive benefits to students, to the employers of graduates, to local communities, to broader publics, um, and on that basis, regain trust. Okay, thanks very much. That's a great comment. Um, mo moving on, um, uh, Tony, sorry, Tony, you, uh, you're, you're next, sorry. Tony. Well, and very quickly, well, some of the main problems universities in my eyes <clears throat> come if I put it this way, from misguided government policies, which many of us opposed in the House of Lords, but weren't listened to, involving privatization, reckless expansion, um, huge student debt, huge student debt, added to all the other issues that students face. Um, I, that, those, those issues will be here for a long while, and obviously in the context of the post-pandemic, if, that if that's what it is. But I'd, I'd like to say that I think this is a period of change such as we've never experienced before. Mm. Humanity is in a different moment. We haven't been here before because of the convergence of a whole new range of changes, which the pandemic to me expresses as much as is the cause of. Because you've got digital revolution and AI. I've spent the last five years concentrating on those. Unbelievably transformative. Probably the beginning of the Asian century. Huge transformations in everyday life, um, Black Lives Matter, gender equality, existential issue of climate change. I'd like to fin finish my little bit by mentioning Greta Thunberg. She went to Davos when Trump was president and she went to the world leaders <clears throat> and she said to them, look at what you're doing for the pandemic. You've pulled out the stops. Why can't you do this for climate change? which is mm. a far deeper threat. Mm. I just think the chance is that maybe this is happening. Maybe this is the end of neoliberalism because you've got gigantic investment, you know, in the, in the New York Times today, now they're up 7 billion, President Biden. Mm. Green deal, 3 billion euros. Green programs in Saudi Arabia, in India, um, China's commitment to transformation. Um, this could be just a, a crucial juncture of history. I would like to see the LSE in there both contributing to this and reflecting this as part of its central mission. Thanks, Tony. Uh, and Manoush, over to you. Just, the only thing I'd add to all those really good comments is, um, you know, I think universities have become, well, I mean, phrase it differently. I think we need to be more integrated in people's lives beyond our students and the people who consume our research. And to be, you know, I think our public events program is a really good example. I think there's a woman called Susan Wolf who's written a lovely comment in the, in yeah. the Q&A who's not an alumna, but who's very, you know, been an active participant in the public events. And there are several people like that who I regularly see at the events for whom this is part of their intellectual life. And one of the benefits of the of the pandemic is that the average number of participants in our public events now, average, is 750. And they come from all over the world. And we're now increasingly doing online education and providing opportunities to a much wider audience. And I just think we need to be, you know, more, more embedded in people's lives around the world, providing education, mm. providing research, providing access to ideas so that 
they see that experts add value, that there is a, a value in genuine knowledge and research, and that it is different than the crap they read on social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I just think that if we can use the next decade to really get stuck in to the lives mm -hmm. of more and more people around the world, I think we would be doing a great thing. Yeah, and I'd also like to make your point as well about Susan, Susan Wolf, who made a very moving comment there. Thank you, Susan. That's very nice. Susan said she's very moved by the occasion and, and, and very much inspired by it. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing to hear. So thanks, Susan. I'll just make, make that point. Now, I've got a, quite a few questions you, you won't be surprised to hear coming in. Um, the first one from my old friend Tim Frost is out there somewhere. Hi, Tim. Uh, great supporter of the school over, over many years. And um, it, Tim provocative questions, I might say, so Tim, or series of questions all in one. But, but boiling it down to its essence, I think, Tim, is how do we stay different, the LSC? How do we keep it? I think all, all of you have touched on that. How is it we just don't become like somewhere else, giving out lots of good degrees to lots of people who then go on to earn lots of money? So who would like to kick off with that one? How do we keep it different? Craig, you look like somebody might have a... <clears throat> Why did you start? And then I'll move to Tony. Craig first. Well, sure. Uh, Tim, hi. And as always, um, you're asking a key question. Um, yeah. I alluded to one bit of the story, which was how a very independent LSE became incorporated into a national system. And I would now say in many ways, an international market-based system. We, um, for... Um, good reasons became part of something that also reduced our distinctness and control. And we see this still going on with research assessment and teaching assessment and standardized um, systems of looking at what a university is. Every university ranking, the Times um, Higher Education or other, is among other things, a pressure for conformity. Do the same thing, but just be slightly better at it. And so we have, if we want to be different, I don't know about reading Mao, which you suggested, um, <laughs> but we have to think for ourselves. We have to ask ourselves, what is really important at the level of designing our individual courses, updating the material in them at the level of larger institutional policies, as we do with public programs, what's really important in the world? And how are we going to reorient ourselves to making sure that that's in the forefront for us. When the LSE was founded, that meant economics, which was being overlooked at many other places or looked down upon. Um, I think it's kind of caught on by now. That's not the new thing. But what is the um, new intellectual perspective that is going to help us deal with the world? <clears throat> Tony's alluded to some. Tony, I think you, that's a cue for you, Tony. Um, well, I, I think the LSE will sustain its uniqueness because it's kind of embedded in its role. And I don't at the moment see too many challenges for that role because it takes a long while to establish a reputation, even in the digital age. And the LSE must build on its strengths. But I mean, to me, it would be a new version of what I think all of us as directors tried to do, you must be activist about it. To me, you must recognize this is a world of just huge dislocation, not just caused by the pandemic, as I said, and the LSE has to be on the frontiers of research about mm. all of that. This is much more global than it used to be before, but the LSE has also got really good global networks. So I think it's in a very powerful position. Still LSE, the one and only place to be, I would say. <laughs> I think LSE has got to be in the avant-garde. I mean, to me, I'm trying to write a book called Off the Edge of History because I think, you know, while embedded in it, I mean, it's not about the LSE, but generically. As I said before, we're in a different phase of global uh, change today, uh, where many of the issues we face simply not been faced by most previous generations. The LSE must track those things and be a policy-making organization. And it must um, continually examine its global role because the digital world changes everything. You know, 
and mm. it, globalization has different meaning to me. Global fundamental mistake treat globalization as primarily economic. Mm. It's primarily interconnection. I can mm. be a Chinese student at the LSE. I can pick up my mobile phone. I can call my family back home, and I can see them, and they can see me, and seemingly for nothing. What kind of world is that? Mm. It's a different world. Manoush, got any thoughts on that one? How do we keep? Uh, you're 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 in charge. How do we keep the LSE different now? Well, I think we've I think we've done the right thing to stick to the social sciences. If we became a universal university, we'd become just like everybody else. So I think that's very distinctive. I think there have been various moments where we flirted with having campuses all over the world. Um, and I think we rightly decided, you know what, it's in the name. We're the London School of Economics. Exactly. And instead, exactly. we're the most global university in London. And I think that's right. And I think what we've thought a lot about in our thinking about our strategy is, um, is around global impact. That is something that's quite distinctive about us. A lot of places have international students. Nobody's as genuinely global as we are. And nobody has the capacity to have that degree of global impact. Um, you know, when you look at participation in our public events now, everyone has representation from all over the world. And I think, I just think that's really different. Um, and, you know, the, I, I sometimes joke the LSE, you know, the French really love public intellectuals. In the UK, you don't really have an individual as a public intellectual, but the LSE as an institution is a public intellectual for the world. Mm. Hmm. And uh, and that's really distinctive. You know, you don't think of other universities in that way. Uh, and so I think if we hold on to that, those things that make us really different, and don't, as I think as Craig said, don't be tempted to homogenize and to be like everybody else. Hmm. Uh, hmm. I think that's got to be the right strategy. Yeah. Uh, I, if I could just add before I bring Julia in on that one, it's not only our students. It's also back. If you look at the history of the faculty of the of the school going back to the very early day and actually the vision of the webs and 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 gb shaw and graham wallace you know they always thought that the school would be not only at the heart of london which is the capital of an empire but that would also make it they didn't use the word globalization then as tony well knows they used other terms it was actually a center of an imperial system but from day one i think they saw this as the global enterprise floor. and if you look at the student numbers even in the interwar period, I've done a bit of a study on that with Sue Donnelly, by the way, a great historian of the school and, and archivist as well, who I should be mentioning here as well. Terrific numbers of students coming from Asia, from Japan, from China, and from Germany. And increasingly, of course, between the wars from the United States. So you, it, and everybody said, and when, when the LSE decamped to Cambridge, you, you know that, Manoush, during the war, uh, uh, you know, it, it was simply the contrast between the the students from the LSE and no criticism of Cambridge, of course, they were very nice to after us for all those years, but the contrast was often made. Sorry, Julia, to break in there. I got a bit excited on that one. Julia, <laughs> sorry about that. So I'm um, in absolutely the same vein, which is we have to continually challenge ourselves. We can't be complacent. Yes, we are. We are globally leading in many areas. In many areas, we're not as globally leading as we might want to think ourselves to be. And so we have to keep challenging ourselves to, to be looking around corners. You know, where, where should we be going? Not to, um, and I think the way that you can see, you can kind of trace our intellectual journey as it were as an institution, as opposed to individual uh, uh, academics, career parts, career kind of research areas through the courses that we teach, but also how we organize ourselves. So organizations and groups that you have and what you call things are, are signs of what an organization pays attention to. Mm. Uh, and just in the last, so if I just use the span of 2014, going back as a, as a convenient kind of time, you know, in that time we are, or in the last few years, we have created a Department of Health Policy mm. out of Department of Social Policy because that grew up as, a, as an area, it became so big that actually it was it needed to be visible, it wasn't visible, so we created a Department of Health Policy, so, and we have one of the leading uh, centres in there. Social psychology, you know, transformed itself into the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Sciences, which was one of the new kind of areas moving through. We've recognized the rise mm. of computational social science by, you know, setting up the Data Science Institute. We're training our, our students in digital skills through Digital Skills Lab, et cetera. And we just have to keep moving. We just mm. cannot stop. 
Um, mm. And as, as Grace said, innovation is hard. Innovation is, is difficult. Change is difficult. But you, you just can't, you can't stop. You know, mm. in order to, for everything, to, you can't, you know, you can't stand still. Yeah, no. I think that's great. I, just, I, I mentioned one other thing. I mean, as, as you know, you all know that I helped establish the center, one of the centers at the school. And but without talking about me, obviously not going to do that. Um, I do that enough myself. It is, I think also, also our centers and institutes have made a contribution over that's that's been an area where you can develop new things that go yeah, back a long way absolutely. to the 1960s. You look how successful the US center has now become under yeah. uh, un, un, under the leadership of Pete Trubovitz. You know how the development of the Institute Inequalities Institute uh, under yeah. under Chico Ferreira. You you look at all the various the New Africa Institute. This does draw in money, it yeah. makes us international, and it creates areas where you can do innovation. Sometimes more easy to do than I think sometimes yeah. like departments alone, which have a fundamental function, which I, I defend to the death, but can't do the same things that centres can sometimes. Yeah. We've got another. Cities question. is another good example. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've got a good question coming in because it follows on from what you were saying, Julia, a little bit about Brexit. It comes from Udo Schmeisser. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correct, Udo. It's really about what he thinks, and Manoush can obviously come in on this, and everybody can come in on this, about the impact of Brexit. You talked about the shock on the night. I certainly felt it. We've been thinking about how this is going to affect our, not just our, but higher education's role in this country as being at the centre not only, you know, of Britain, uh, but also, obviously, from our point of view, of Europe. How do we think it's going to impact on that? Do you want to go on that first, Julia, or maybe, and then follow up with Manoush and then anybody else? Julia? Um, so I think, so I mean, there's some certain practical things, which is, you know, EU students now have to pay overseas fees. They don't have the same access to, uh, therefore, to the LSE as, um, as they did before. So we need to you know we need to be focusing our efforts on fundraising for scholarships i mean we have always been focusing on that and now is even more important not only for eu students but for others coming in um i think in terms of um in, ter in terms of practicalities in terms of our access to research funding in the eu that was a long battle which we started back in june 2016 we had to have a last scramble uh, just in the last few weeks to to secure budget for that out of the last uh, spending round to to make sure that we can uh, affiliate and be access to that huge collaborative pool of research knowledge and networks which are just the lifeblood of research and academia as we know and it's, it is a global enterprise it is not uh, to go back to Tony's point on on connectedness and globalization is absolutely the lifeblood of the re of, of research um, so that has been secured, but I think there is still, and the the initial personal panic that, that people, you know, understandably had in terms of citizenship, of their families, of working through our wonderful uh, home office uh, system for getting yourself the ability to stay in a country you've been for years and years. So that has sort of calmed down, but I think what is now is, is a, re, a reorientation of of, as ever of Britain's place in the world. As far as the LSE's place in the world, though, I think that's, we're quite secure in that. We've always known what our global strategy is and it has always been a global strategy. Um, so I think, you know, we're still working through that, but we will need to, you know, just work doubly hard basically to ensure that we keep up the, the relationships and the connectivity, which is absolutely essential to, to who we are. Okay. And, um... Manoush, I think this comes to you too. No, nothing to add really to what Julia said. Okay, great. And, uh, Tony or Craig on, on the Brexit question, do you think we've answered that already? Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, the, the LSE has to be activist about this. Brexit isn't something that simply happened. It's not something mm. that's done. Continuing mm. the process, you know, in committees I've been in in the parliament, um, we've been tracking events in Northern Ireland. You can see you know, something going on with the whole kind of consequences for the UK as a whole, uh, which will affect its relationship with the rest of Europe. Universities are obliged, I think, to track those. Um, there are serious issues, I think, with the loss of the Erasmus programme and so forth. So there are plenty of issues to think through, but the only way to do it is to be proactivist about it and develop new sorts of connections on the part of the LSC, I think, to major institutions. Um, we tried to do that um, with um, the Ecole Normale in my time. I don't know if that still goes on, but 
we always had to do that anyway. But as if I understand it, thanks, Tony. As I understand it, Manoush, uh, you, you, you're better informed than me on this. Have our numbers from EU countries declined, or but our overall numbers have not? Is that is that? No. I mean, this, the overall numbers in terms of applicants from Europe have not declined. Okay. There's been a slight differentiation. I, I would say they haven't gone up as much as other parts of the world have gone up. Okay. They haven't yeah. declined. They've actually increased, yeah. but by less than, say, it, from India, for example. There's a little bit of differentiation across Europe. So, for example, the France and German numbers are really strong, whereas the Polish numbers are a bit weak. Yeah. You can see a little bit of differentiation, but the overall numbers are holding up. Well, that's good. that's good to hear. Now, got Nick, to... can I stick in one more yeah. thing? I'm yeah, not going sorry, to talk about the practical I want, side of, of I didn't Brexit, want to get you involved in internal are... UK affairs. You know. Yeah, I, I you know, <laughs> outsider <laughs> intervenes. People always no, no, said, please do. what's this American talking about that for? No, the, no, um, but what I want to say is that Brexit is one of a number of indicators globally that the kind of cosmopolitan globalization, which the LSE has um, often uh, been committed, isn't popular with everyone. And so mm -hmm. I think the, you know, there was a local shock about this because as you hinted, Mick, um, in Houghton Street, there would have been um, a much stronger vote to remain than mm -hmm. in much of the rest of the country. But also, um, this is a story that is not unique to Britain, and part of the, the pathos of the EU is that it's going on in a variety of other settings, but also around the world. And so we're in a moment where we can't take for granted that there is the same sort of, of desire and embrace of the kind of global vision um, that I think most of us think is important, um, but which for whatever reason we have not made attractive to all of our fellow citizens in different countries. No, that's a fair point. I, I, I won't ask you the question of Donald Trump because I think I'll know what the answer is. But yeah, I mean, you know, we, we're, we're facing not just a British phenomenon, we're facing an international phenomenon. I, I'm just picking and choose, taking out questions here and there. There's one little uh, nice comment from an Elizabeth Miller. This is very much international relations about one of the great figures of international relations. This is about a man called Philip Windsor. And um, she makes, it's a kind of memory really, which is very nice. Philip, I knew a little bit. Um, and he said, chain smoking, not a note in sight and gave the best lectures Elizabeth have ever heard at the LSE. And I can attest to the brilliance. And I always wonder, will we keep attracting people like Philip Windsor, um, e even without the cigarettes? I don't know, I'm not sure that's a question or a statement or a bit of nostalgia on, on, on my part. We're moving on. I've got a question, a very interesting one from a, one of our Chinese friends, Zhao Lai Zhang. I hope I'm pronouncing you correctly there, Zhao Lai. It's about the LSE in China. And because we, let, let's be honest, we all know the relations uh, with the West and China at the moment are not going through the, let's say, best period. It's not its worst period. I can remember much worse periods. Um, going back to Chairman Mao, by the way, Tim Frost point. But uh, where does that relationship go to, do you think? Because one of the challenges is Brexit, but one of the challenges is also that we know that so many students from the PRC, from Hong Kong as well, you know, play a key role in British and indeed American higher education. How does that relationship continue? How do we make it, uh, you know, how do we keep it going without su su succumbing, I suppose, to government pressure? I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll go to you, Manoush, first on that one, because that must be a question that you or Julia or anybody has kind of thought about. Yeah. I mean, actually, LSE's relationship with China goes way back to an early delegation from uh, the Chinese government when they were looking where to send their diplomats abroad. Okay. They, they couldn't send them to the US. Oxford and Cambridge were way too traditional and conservative. And so they sent them all to the LSE. Um, and so it's an old relationship. And, you know, I think particularly at a time when there are tensions having students from China and having students from the rest of the world engaging with students from China at the LSE mm. in a space where there is intellectual challenge and rigor is a really good thing. And I think we have an important role to play in, uh, in providing a place where, where those conversations happen. 
Uh, mm. We also have a hugely important role to play in research. We also have faculty who are Chinese, mm. uh, and we, you know, we teach students from from uh, from China online. And so, mm. Uh, mm. you know, I think the values that the LSE have have a particularly important role at this particular moment. Be it focusing on evidence, focusing on rigor, focusing on open debates, freedom mm. of speech, uh, mm. and we need to uphold those. Mm. Uh, Tony, maybe, or Julia? Tony, yeah, come in, please. <clears throat> well, let me say, first of all, that I'm a great admirer of China. I think what's been achieved in China is stupendous. Nothing like that has ever been achieved before. Massive process of modernization in such a short period. China is diverse. It's not just monolithic culture. Some of the universities there are now really top class. I know, like Manoush, we've been in contact with quite a few of them. It's up to, I think, the LSE to develop um, connections in an activist way. Would have had to do that anyway. I mean, we know there are these geopolitical tensions. Mm. On the other hand, um, as I'm saying, I think the, one of the core areas is climate change. And China, I think, is going to cooperate um, in doing some of the massive transformations that have to be carried out you know, the world, again, has never experienced anything like that. So I think from the LSE's point of view, the thing is just to be activist about it, to develop connections with the leading Chinese universities further. You look at some of those universities, they're now ranked really highly in the world. Mm -hmm. And amazing to me, having spoken digitally at some of them, um, just, you know, how this has all happened. So I think this is, this is a field for exploration and not just how do we get around the geopolitical tensions myself? Mm. I mean, just to add what to, to Tony said, uh, I, I co-chair with the president of Tsinghua University, the Global Alliance for University on yeah. Climate. And that's a really good example where we've got the world's leading universities thinking about solutions to climate change, yeah. where, you know, if that's the issue, if, you know, no issue more than that is one where we need to solve collectively and collaborating with China is really important. And, and, and just on the yes. long-term association, which was earlier mentioned, the foundation of Chinese anthropology really began with Bronislav Malinowski, Fei, who did these wonderful studies on rural China. And by the way, Fei suffered grievously in the Cultural Revolution. And, and of course, I had also mentioned the, the long-term role of the LSE Beda, Peking University Summer School, which has been- Don't forget the Trobriand Islands though. Well, we, so the, you know, you mentioned Fei Shaltong. At the somebody told me that I should say something about resilience today. And Fei Shaltong is a, um, a good example of that, bouncing back in his career to continue to do remarkable yeah. work after that. Um, I wanted to just say that, that we look at this from various angles, one of which should be China's need for the LSE. Um, that at, and it's similar today to what it was when that first delegation was sent um, in international relations, um, uh, which included near the beginning Yang Jieqi, who went on to become um, a foreign minister and then state counselor, a key architect of, of China's diplomatic roles in the world after his early exposure to the LSE. And part of what China gets from the LSE is a global perspective it can't get very easily otherwise, and which is enormously important as China becomes a bigger and more important global power. And I think there is recognition in China that there's a learning process on how to be an effective um, global power, um, not just how much power you have, but the skills and the perspectives. And there's a recognition of LSE as one of the sources of these. Yeah, and, and the reputation of LSE in China is very, very high. Uh, and not because it slavishly follows any line, but be because it is the LSE. I mean, it's as, as simple as that. Julia, I, I, I'm, I'm aware that I haven't asked you to come in on this one, but I think to be fair and to be balanced and, and to bring you in, if you've got any thoughts on this as well yourself. No, just to absolutely echo what's been said, but I think we also have to recognise that you know, engaging with China is a troubling thing for, for many people and many of our faculty to do because of its record on human rights and because mm. of its, its political regime, et cetera. So 
But at the same time, it's not, we can't go, we can't, as many have said otherwise, you know, it's not, this isn't a Cold War situation whereby, you know, one part of the world just closes itself off and it can do because there's no mm. connectedness. We have that connectedness that Tony was talking about before. So mm. we have to find a way to engage. And that includes LSE as an institution. And that does include dealing with the, the very different and contestation, contest, the very, the, the contest that there are as exactly as to what our relationship would be, which is the same as what a country's relationship or a company's, et cetera, and recognize that we have very different views in, on, uh, on campus about that. But as Manu said, that we have to deal with these through the way that we, we deal with other issues, which is through reasoned argument, respectful, respectful mm -hmm. engagement and debate. Yeah, I think that's a very good point on, on which to conclude and to draw it to an end because we've come very close to the end of what I think has actually been a wonderful session. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed chairing it. I felt very privileged to be chairing it. And I again, thank Manoush for asking me to do the chairing. I'm still working on the book, Craig, don't worry. <laughs> it is coming. It might be ready for the 150th anniversary, but I, I, I hope a little bit before then. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Craig, again, uh, for coming all the way as you've come, you know, virtually uh, from, I, I suppose you're in Arizona at the moment. Best wishes to you. And uh, thanks to everybody. So fill in the forms. Uh, goodbye. And thanks again to Manoush, to Julia, to Craig. And, and again, last but not least, my old friend, Tony Giddens. Thanks, everybody. And good evening and goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.